good weekend. Um, hopefully the test wasn't too bad, especially because it was open book and open notes. Uh, hopefully you did pretty well and you saw your scores right away. I'll, I gave you, I think, an extra day just because I wasn't sure what time zone you're in. Uh, we're starting chapters five and six, which are on forces. Um, most of it really <laughs> review, very, very, e very easy material. But I'll throw a few things in there just for excitement. Um, there's not much calculus except for drag forces, um, which we'll talk about in just a little bit tonight. Um, Isaac Newton's Principia, um, published in 1687, changed everything. Um, it became sort of the standard for physics uh, for the next uh, 300 some years, um, just like Euclid's principles, um, or sorry, Euclid's elements were used for, as the basics of teaching math for almost, good gracious, um, almost two centuries. Um, it was one of those defining moments, one of the most important books in physics. Um, just real quick, we're going to look at kinematics, description of motion, and the dynamics, the study of the causes of motions. Um, study of motion has been going on for a long time. Aristotle thought objects only move when you had a force acting on them. Without a force, object would come to rest. Galileo realized that moving objects had inertia, is the word he used. Their motion uh, persisted unless something acted on them. He rolled marbles down ramps, noticed that they would go up the ramp again. Newton's first law, a little bit later, um, object at rest stays at rest unless acted upon an external force, and an object in motion stays in motion unless acted upon by the external force. Um, what causes an acceleration, the push or pull? Um, please remember Newton actually defined not only motion, but also did gravitational force, circular motion, properties of light, heat flow, and the foundations of calculus. And his uh, mechanics held until the 20th century when we realized, oh, wait a second, or actually Einstein did. Um, there are some interesting cases. Motion near the speed of light, special relativity. Um, space and time itself bending with very large masses um, or energies, that's general relativity. And quantum mechanics, that's mechanics on the, on the atomic scale where things pop in and out of existence, <laughs> which makes things a little bit more exciting. Um, object at rest stays at rest. If no force is acting on a body, then an object's velocity does, cannot change. The way Newton actually wrote this was a little bit different. He didn't write it F equals MA, although that's simply the way we write it. Uh, please remember that mass is a scalar, um, and force and accelerations are vectors. So the force and the acceleration are always pointing in the same way. Uh, the way that Newton wrote it was actually as a derivative. The derivative of momentum with respect to time gives us our force. Um, both these equations, if you check real quick, you could rewrite this as mass times dv over dt, which sure enough is the acceleration or mass times acceleration. So the two are equivalent. Um, it's just that Newton wrote it in terms of the change of momentum of an object. Real quick on this one, uh, talking about inertia, if you've got two similar strings holding an object up, if you pull or gi give this bottom string a quick jerk, the inertia of this object, the tendency not to want to get in motion, will cause this bottom string to break. If you start pulling on it slowly and just keep pulling harder and harder, then the top string breaks because it's going to have a greater tension in it because this string is holding up the weight of this object plus it's balancing the force you're pulling on it. So you can actually choose where the string breaks, top or bottom, depending if you give it a quick jerk or if you pull on it slowly until it breaks. Speaking of that one, um, this is an oversimplified diagram. But most of you know that your seatbelts in your car, you can very easily pull out um, to stretch it across your lap to click it in. But in an accident, it locks up. How does it work? Um, in motion of the car is normally this way. If the car suddenly stops or decelerates rapidly, this pendulum swings forward, which locks in this little bar um, and prevents this thing from moving forward and prevents you from hitting the dashboard. In more modern cars, they've actually sort of combined all this apparatus into a separate wheel that also rotates along with this and locks it in place. Makes it a little bit more compact. Um, 
how do we figure out the fact that masses and forces are related? Um, you apply a force to an object and measure its acceleration. Um, some objects accelerate more rapidly with the same amount of force. Um, and we discovered that, oh, that depends on the amount of mass or inertia that the object has. Um, when we're talking about that, we're talking about the inertial mass, how difficult it is to get an object mo moving, and once moving, how difficult it is to get it stopped. Whee! Um, mass is an intrinsic property of, of an object. It doesn't change where you're at. Um, and we already talked about the fact that acceleration and force are vectors. So if this is a one kilogram mass, its mass doesn't change no matter where you move it. Um, in the middle of space, it would still have a mass of one kilogram. On the surface of the moon, its mass would still be one kilogram. The things that do change are the force of gravity on it, depending on where you have it. On the Earth's surface, the force of gravity would be 9.8 newtons. In space, no force of gravity, assuming you're far away from the planets. And on the moon's surface, about 1.6 newtons, because uh, the acceleration of gravity on, there, on the moon's surface is about 1.6 meters per second squared. Um, superposition of forces, if you've got more than one force acting on it, you add those forces to find the direction of the net force, and that's going to be the direction of the acceleration. Ah, so this one. Um, this, this one's one of those fun little AP kind of problems. I realize it's ancient. But what you've got here is an object sitting on a surface, and you've got four different cases. In the first case, it's velocity zero. Its mass is two kilograms, which means the weight on it, of course, has to be 20 newtons. Now, before we answer anything else, let's look at the rest of this. Uh, force of friction zero, mu is not available. We're applying a force of five newtons downward. Interesting. So we're applying a five newton force downward on this thing which means if the force of gravity is also 20 newtons, it means the normal force has got to be 25 newtons acting upward. Um, net force is going to be zero. The acceleration is zero. You're like, oh, that was so easy. Yeah. The first one's kind of nice. Um, case number two, velocity is constant, which means our acceleration has to be zero, which means the net force has to be zero. But take a look at this one real quick. Um, in this case, the force of gravity is 25. We're not given anything else except mu. Um, so first of all, the mass must be, if I do gravity equals 10, 3.5 kilograms. And assuming there's no other external, well, we don't know what the applied force is, huh? Let's assume then that there's only a horizontal force applied to balance the force of friction to keep it moving at constant speed. So in that case, the normal force is going to be 35 newtons. And how do we figure out the force of kinetic friction? Because in this case, it has to, it's moving. We know it's actually moving. Remember, that's the normal force times mu. So in this case, it has to be 7 newtons. Um, and we're not told what direction this thing's moving, left or right. Um, so what has to be applied force? The applied force also has to be 7 newtons. Um, and now one of these has to be left and the other one has to be right for this thing to have a net force of zero. All right. I'm going to pause the video here, or I recommend that you pause the video here and give case three and four a try. Just grab a piece of scrap paper, give it a shot. I'm going to count down from five before I try to find the answers for these two. Five, four, three, two, one. All right. So case three, we know the weight is 60 newtons, which means this mass has to be six kilograms. Um, this object is accelerating at one third meter per second to the right, which means the net force has to be one third times that two newtons to the right. We're told that the force of friction is 24 newtons to the left, which means our applied force, if I need a net force of 2 newtons to the right, has to be 26 newtons to the right. And then finally, what's the coefficient of friction? Um, 
we know that in this case, force of kinetic friction is equal to mu sub k, oh, sorry, it's really bad, times normal force. Um, so in this case, 24 equals mu times 60, uh, dividing both sides by 12, uh, two-fifths. Ah, so mu has to be 0 0.4 if I did my math right. All right, and the other one here, uh, we know the weight has to be 90 kilograms, or sorry, 90 newtons, <laughs> 9 kilogram object. Um, mu is that. The force applied is this, and we know that it's changing. Hmm. Let's figure out the force. Okay, let's assume that the force is acting on our left and right. Uh, if mu is, let's assume that the normal force then is also 90 newtons. There's nothing else for acting vertically. Uh, the force of friction then is going to be 27 newtons. Now, the question is, we've got a force of 27 newtons, and we've got an applied force of 18 newtons. It's possible that the force of, that it's moving already to the Hmm, let me think about that. That it's moving to the right. So it's going this way. Ignore this other one here. Now remove that. And that we've got the applied force is 18 newtons this way while 27 is acting this way. And it's slowing down. Or it's possible that it's moving to the left. And we're trying to slow it down. And so both my applied force and my force of friction are acting this way. Huh. So it's possible. We're not actually given enough information on this one. There are two possible solutions. Let me do this solution right here where it's initially moving to the left. In that case, um, this would also be acting to the left, or sorry, um, to be acting to the right. So my net force would be the sum of these two um, would be 45 newtons to the right, which means my acceleration, if this is a 9-kilogram object, um, would be 5 meters per second squared towards the right. The other option, I just want to quick show you, is if the object was moving um, towards the right and you're applying your 18 newtons acting this way and friction acting against the motion is acting this way with a force of 27 newtons. Now, um, force of friction would be 27 newtons towards the left. Uh, my net force now would actually be be 9 newtons to the left, and my acceleration will be 1 meter per second squared towards the left. Now, is that possible? Um, that, I'm a, that it's sliding this way and I'm applying a force this way, but it's not enough to overcome this, and the object's slowing down? The answer is yes. Um, so both of these options are actually val are, are possible for this one, as far as I can tell. All right, moving on. Um, what happens here if you've gotten an acceleration of zero in the middle here? It means that the sum of these three forces must add up to zero. Um, and so how could you solve this real quick? If you added A and B together and found its resultant, this resultant here has to be exactly equal to f sub c. Um, and so you could also do it in unit vector notation. Um, unit of force, of course, are newtons. It's the amount of force required to accelerate a, a mass of one kilogram at one meter per second squared. Um, and it's pretty doggone easy. Just again, remember, acceleration and force are vectors. Mass is a scalar. Um, and we talked a little bit about reference frames before. Um, a reference frame... Um, it's called inertial frame if Newton's laws are valid. In other words, there's no acceleration going on, it, on in it. Um, 
an object in an accelerating vehicle will accelerate without a net force acting on it, <laughs> or will appear to from that reference frame. Let me quick explain. Um, let's say you're inside of a van, and this is a really bad van. I'm going to make it into a truck. Um, you're in a semi-truck, and you're sitting here with an air hockey table. Don't know, I don't know why you would ever do this. Um, and you've got a puck sitting on it. And again, air hockey table is fairly frictionless. If you were observing that puck from inside of this system, and you're sitting here inside the truck, and the truck began to accelerate forward, from your perspective, this puck would seem to accelerate, and I'm going to put the acceleration in quotation marks, it would seem to start accelerating backwards. It would start moving that way as the truck accelerated that way. In reality, what's really happening from a reference frame, for somebody sitting outside who could somehow peer inside, let's say this thing had a window, they would actually notice that the puck actually didn't move at all. It actually stayed in place as the truck accelerated forward. Um, so we run into reference frame issues. Um, inside of a non-inertial reference frame, things will seem to accelerate without a net force acting on them. Um, the, <laughs> just a real quick note, um, if we're on the planet, technically everything that's around us is undergoing centripetal acceleration, and that's not equal to zero, except if you're at the poles. Because of that, we get a slight unusual effect. For example, the Coriolis effect, where winds seem to twist slightly, or water seems to go down the drain in a certain direction, is because of the fact that we're in a non-inertial frame of reference. But for most things, it's close enough. Um, the centripetal acceleration, even at the equator, is only a, a small number. Uh, oh, <laughs> I can't remember it off the top of my head. You could calculate it real quick, um, just with omega squared r where omega is 2 pi over 86,400, and r is 6.36 times 10 to the 6 meters. You could calculate it, and I just can't do it fast enough in my head. Sorry. Um, three astronauts pushing on an object. In this case, this astronaut here is pushing with 32 newtons at this angle. This astronaut here is pushing at a 41 newtons, 60 degrees from it. And this astronaut's using their, his thrusters in, or her thrusters and accelerating it this way with a force of 55 newtons. How do you find the total here? Um, you just do the good old vector components. In this case, you can do a little bit of vector algebra. And you'll discover that um, the total acceleration here is given by this unit vector equals the mass times the acceleration. And you'll come up with the accelerations equal to this in unit vector notation. If you want to find the, the magnitude of the acceleration, you can just do the unit vector notation. 0 0.86 squared plus negative 0 0.16 squared. And you'll discover that's equal to 0 0.88. And if you want to find the angle, you could just do the two components of this one. Um, the x is 0.86 this way. Uh, the y is, not to scale, <laughs> 0 0.16 this way. And you can figure out the angle th of this resultant just by doing a little bit of tangent stuff. In this case, negative 11 degrees. Um, interesting enough, on Earth, um, if you drop an object, you get g, the free fall acceleration. And from Newton's second law, you can very quickly figure it out. Um, the weight of an object is the magnitude of net force required to prevent it from falling freely, which in this case is just m times g. Um, this particular mass is technically not called inertial mass, it's called gravitational mass. And believe it or not, and ironically, gravitational mass and inertial mass, for some odd reason in our universe, are identical. They would not have to be, but they are. It's kind of fun. Um, you can measure, oh yeah, so, oh, that's interesting, free fall acceleration on the moon, 1.7. I used 1.6 a moment ago. I, this is probably correct to two sig figs, my apologies. Um, if you used a pan balance on the moon, it would still work. But if you used a spring scale here, um, on the moon, that same melon, if it didn't explode in the vacuum, um, would actually only pull it down a smaller distance, and the arrow would point over here if you're on the moon. This works equally well on or the Earth's surface or, or the moon, because if it's balanced, the same mass must be on each side. 
Um, Newton's uh, normal forces, we talked a lot about those already. What, again, produces normal forces? Th think about the bonds between the molecules that make up a tabletop. And the molecules, atoms, are very small. Basically, you can think about the bonds as being springs. It's electrical equilibrium, the shared electrons in a bond. What happens when you apply a force to it? It distorts or bends. And this force, the restoring force of these springs, pushing back this way, is what we call the normal force. Yeah, um, you also get a bit of repulsion. Why doesn't your finger go between <laughs> the atoms or molecules? Mostly because of the repulsion of the electrons and also a bit of Pauli exclu exclusion principle. Um, yeah, we already talked about friction. Uh, just a quick reminder on this one, just in passing. The force of kinetic friction, that is between two moving surfaces, is equal to mu sub k times normal force. It just has one value. And the force of static friction is less than or equal to mu sub s times normal force, which is greater or equal to zero. So the force of static friction between two sta or stationary surfaces um, can range anywhere between zero up to this maximum value. If you exceed this maximum value, you switch to kinetic friction because now you have a sliding object. Again, remember that this the kinetic friction for most surfaces is smaller than the maximum force of static friction. Uh, looking at it real quick, remember tensions. Pulleys just redirect tensions without changing its magnitude. Unless this pulley has rotational inertia. Uh, for now, uh, that's chapter later. Um, for now, we're going to assume they do not. So we'll just assume they redirect the tension without changing its magnitude. The same thing is here true or as well. Um, just a quick reminder on this one. If you've got an 11 kilogram sausage, <laughs> um, the force of gravity right here, let's make gravity 10. This will read 110 newtons because the pulley just redirects that tension. So the tension here is going to be 110. The tension here is 110. Um, please realize that to hold the spring scale here, this has to have a tension here of 110 newtons. The spring scale, though, just reads 110. It doesn't add up these two tensions. Uh, that tension there is just holding this in place, which is why you can replace this with another identical sausage. And the spring scale here will not read 220 newtons. It's still going to read 110, just like it would here. Um, oh, 108 if you use 9.8. Um, can you get a free ride? This is called a bosun's chair. Um, and what's going to happen here is you, the bosun's chair usually has a rope going up to a pulley, and you've got another rope over here. Can you lift yourself up? And the answer is you can. What's going to happen here? If you've got the force of gravity acting on here, which is the mass of the person plus the chair, the tension here plus the tension here, there's two upward forces on this system, must equal this. So ends up here, the tension of the rope is actually mg over 2 because you know the tension has to be the same over on this side, mg over 2, and the sum of these two upward tensions equals the force of gravity. So yes, you can actually pull yourself up on this thing, um, ironically. And so the tension 1 half mg. How much do you weigh in an accelerating elevator? Um, just real quick here, what happens is it's just the normal force minus the force of gravity equals the acceleration. If you're accelerating downward, um, the normal force is going to be m times g minus your acceleration. If you're accelerating upward, it's going to be equal to mass times gravity plus whatever upward acceleration you have. And you've felt this before in an elevator that's accelerating upward. The normal force, the push that you feel upward, is larger than your weight. If you're accelerating downward, um, the normal force is smaller than that, and it, <laughs> it feels like your stomach's going up. Um, and, yeah, it's just more examples on this one. Um, here's Einstein in an elevator. Um, just real quick on this one, what happens if he's accelerating upward at this rate? You could very quickly figure out what the net force is. Let me just do this real quick. Um, if Newton, if, uh, sorry, if Einstein's accelerating upward, to accelerate, 
his mass, 72.2, at an acceleration of 3.2. Um, grabbing your calculators just real quick. 72.2 times 3.2 means we need to have a net force of roughly, oops, finding my spot here. The net force has to be 231 newtons. What does that mean? Um, let's make gravity 10 just real quick on this one. If he's accelerating upward, that means my net force has to be acting upward. Force of gravity on Einstein is just um, 722 newtons, just taking his mass times that, which means the normal force in this case has to be larger than this by that amount which means this has to be um, 953 newtons. What happens if it accelerates downward? Then the normal force is going to have to be 231 newtons downward, which means we need to have a net force that way. This force doesn't change no matter what you're doing, but it means that the normal force in this case is going to be 231 newtons less than that. All right. Oh, quick side note on this one. Why is Einstein in an elevator? Uh, just because Einstein, in his general theory of relativity, stated that there's no way to tell if you're standing on the scale here. Here's Einstein a scale. Sitting on the surface of the Earth, he would see stationary. He would see a normal force. The scale would read 722 newtons. Einstein's thought experiment said... There's no way to tell the difference if you're standing on the surface of the Earth or if you've got a rocket engine propelling you and it's accelerating you this way at 9.8 meters per second squared. You would read the same normal force. Actually, I should have made it 10 to make that work. Um, you would read the same normal force here, and there's no experiment you could do inside of this sealed rocket where you could determine if you were in an accelerating rocket ship or if you were on the surface of the planet. Anyway, interesting idea. Um, in this case, uh, we've got sliding blocks on a frictionless surface. The question is, what's the acceleration? In this case, the tension over here is 65 newtons. I hope this works out nice. Um, how do we solve it? F net equals ma. And if we look at this as one big system, that's the net force on this. The, uh, we've got, yes, a force of gravity and a normal force acting on each one of those. I'm not going to draw those for clarity because they're equal and opposites. Um, our net force in this case, 65 newtons, equals the total mass being accelerated, which is 12 plus 24 plus 31, um, all times the acceleration. 65 equals 36, oh, yuck, um, 67A. <laughs> Our acceleration is horrible, horrifyingly ugly. Um, 65 divided by 67 gives us an acceleration of um, 0 0.970 meters per second squared. And now I can ask you questions like the tension. Um, what's the required tension right here to accelerate this mass at this rate? Well, just taking 12 times that, uh, we get that the tension over here has to be 11.6 newtons. And you can very quickly realize this has to be 11.6 newtons as well. So the question is, what does this tension have to be to accelerate this mass at that rate? Um, well, first of all, taking, just figuring out the net force on this mass. So now for M2. The net force on it, mass to equal mass times acceleration, or in this case, 24 times that 0 0.970. Or in this case, there has to be a net force of 23.3 newtons towards the right. You're like, oh good, just 23.3. Well, it's got to be 23.3 newtons larger than this force. So 
if you add those together, you'll discover that this has to be about 34.9 newtons, which means this tension acting backwards here is 34.9. That's a 4. And if you work it out, if you subtract these two, you'll find out the net force is exactly the right amount to accelerate this 31 kilogram object at this rate as well. All right? Oh, I've got all the examples in here. Good. Um, oh, okay. Uh, good. Um, weight hanging by a string in an accelerating airplane. I love this one. And on takeoff, you can do it. What's ha happening here, if you do a free body di diagram for our mass, we've got the tension acting this way, and we've got the force of gravity acting this way. What has to be true here? Well, if we break the tension into its vertical and horizontal components, since this mass, we assume, is accelerating only horizontally, this piece here has to be equal to mg. And this piece here is our net force acting on our object. Um, if this is theta is 22 degrees, what can we do? We can say the tangent of 22 degrees is equal to f net over mg, opposite side over adjacent side. Um, or mg times the tangent of 22 degrees is equal to f net. How do we figure out the acceleration? Well, remember that the net force is equal to ma. Mass of our pendulum cancels. And if you just take g, um, yeah, so ir ironically, the mass of the object is not important even though it's given to us. If you take 9.81 times the tangent, oops, lost my tangent, tangent of 22 degrees, you'll discover that the acceleration of this system has to be approximately um, 3.96 meters per second squared towards the right. Oh, I've actually got some more examples in here. Okay, good. Um, when two bodies interact, don't forget um, the force of book B on crate C is equal to the force of crate C on book B. Action reaction forces, be careful on these. Again, remember the force of the earth on this mat of this body is equal to the force of the body on the earth that should be acting at the center of mass of the earth and it's the normal force of the table the force of the table on the block is equal to the force on that so be careful it's always got to be a on b is equal to b on a um, we've tried talked about this in this case the force of mass one on mass two is equal to the force of mass two pushing back on mass one. So in this case, this force here has to be equal to this force here. And this is the applied force due to the hand. Um, problem solving, make sure you always read the problem carefully, draw a rough picture, decide on your system, do a free body diagram for each external force on that system, um, find a convenient coordinate system, especially if you've got ramps, and add vectors vectorially. Add scalars arithmetically. <laughs> um, again, just a reminder on this one, um, just a, in quick in passing, people were angry about Newton's third law because they said it didn't make any sense. Why? Because the force of the horse on the cart was always going to be equal to the force of the cart on the horse. Since these two forces have to be equal according to Newton's third law, there's no way the, f the horse could ever get the cart moving, right? No matter how hard the, the horse pulled, the cart would pull back with the same amount of force. The answer on this one is if you look at the system carefully, those are not the only forces acting. If you look at just the cart, you've got the tension. This is the force of the horse and the cart. And you've got the force of friction between the wheel and the ground. This is larger than this, and yes, it will accelerate in this direction. And yes, you've got the force, normal force, and the weight. And on the horse itself, yes, you've got an equal tension pulling backwards. This is equal to the force of the horse on the cart. But you also have the force of friction between the hooves and the ground, and that is larger than, I'm going to go off the screen, sorry, is larger than this force backwards. And yes, there's a normal force and a force of gravity here. 
But yes, both the horse will accelerate forward and the cart can accelerate forward. Um, what's going to happen here if you've got a frictionless surface, it, it's going to accelerate. We did this last year in um, AP Physics 1. Um, you can very quickly do it by looking at a free by diagram. Where the excitement comes in is when you're looking at the tensions. Um, remember Atwood's machine? We'll do one quick example on with this one. Um, the two tensions are equal, assuming that this doesn't have any rotational inertia. And the two accelerations, therefore, are, are, will also be equal. The two tensions will be equal. Um, you've got two different forces of gravity. Um, what has to happen here, you can very quickly solve it. So take a quick look at it. I want to do one quick example with you. Um, it's a frictionless pulley, which has no rotational inertia. M1 is 0 0.5 kilograms. Sorry, it's really bad. And this is a one kilogram object. Um, let's go ahead and, and use 9.8. So the force of gravity here, 4.9 newtons. Force of gravity on this one, 9.8. Sorry, I should have drawn that a little bit bigger. And we've got two tensions which are identical. First thing I'm going to do is define my system. I'm going to, oh yeah, there's a T2 up here for now. Um, I'm just going to look at this first of all, the solve for T1. Or the initial tension, they call it T1. In this case, the tension is inside my system. The only external forces are these two. How do I solve it? Um, just F net equals MA. Because this force is trying to accelerate the system down this way, and this one's trying to accelerate the system this direction, they're acting against each other, so my net force just 9.8 minus 4.9. The total mass that's being accelerated is the sum of these two. And so we end up with 4.9 equals 1.5a. And the acceleration, um, grab me your calculator real quick. Uh, 4.9 divided by 1.5 gives us oh, 3.27. Probably too many sig figs, but it's okay. Um, so what's the acceleration of M1? It's going to be 3.27 meters per second squared upward. Uh, what are the, what's the tension? To solve the tension now, we need to look at one of these masses by itself so that the tension is not internal to the system but actually becomes part of it. If you solve it real quick, um, I'm just going to look at the 0.5 kilogram mass, F net equals MA. And in this case, the tension, T1, has to be greater than the force of gravity, equals 0 0.5 times the acceleration 3.27. And if you solve this real quick, Give me just a moment. Oops. So the acceleration times 0 0.5 plus 4.9. I get that T1 is equal to 6.53 newtons. If both of these are 6.53, what is the tension acting or acting up this way to hold this whole thing up? Um, remember, this tension is also acting down on these two. So both of these are going to be 6.53 newtons, 6.53 newtons, which means this tension here, T2, to balance that, assuming this has no mass, has to be 13 uh, 0 0.06. I guess let me just call it 13.1 newtons. Um, so I, I guess I should have written this down. 6.53 newtons. And the string connecting to the top, 13.1 newtons. Now the interesting part is this. If you take a look at the total weight of the system, 4.9 plus 9.8, um, <laughs> something seems to be a little bit off. Why? The total downward force is 14.7, but yet this string here is only applying 13.1 newtons upward. How in the world is that possible? Well, I, I think we talked about this before. It's because the center of mass of the system is actually accelerating downward. This is the center of mass. 
because of that, that means the upward force on it has to be smaller than the downward force. Uh, because the larger mass is accelerating downward, and this one's acceler smaller mass accelerating upward, the center of mass of the system, I guess I should draw it like right here, is actually accelerating downward, which means the upward force is going to be smaller than the downward force. And that's a little bit overwhelming initially, but hang in there. Uh, drag force, again, we have actually did this in the previous video, so I'm just going to quickly run through it. Um, and you can very quickly come up with the equation. What I do want to mention, though, is Stokes' Law. And this is one of our last topics of the idea. Um, he, or George Stokes realized that, wait a second, we can actually figure out the drag force of a sphere falling through a very viscous material like glycerin or maple syrup, um, something of that type. But it's actually kind of difficult to calculate it because you have to figure out the velocity gradient near, near each little area of the ball surface and integrating it. Um, but it was actually first completed in the 1840s by Sir George Gabriel S Stokes. And he found that for the viscous drag force on the sphere of radius, supposed to be R, um, moving through a fluid of viscosity eta at low speeds V is given by 6 pi times the radius, times the viscosity of the fluid, times the velocity. The velocity here has to be small, and the flow around this thing here, around the sphere, has to be laminar. And it has to be a sphere, and there can't be any sticking of the particles to it. Uh, no condor effect for those of you in um, aerospace. By the way, here's the viscosities of various materials. How do they find these? Experimentally, by dropping spheres through them and measuring the velocity. Um, and so, yeah, it's pretty easy to calculate things. So, um, just I want to quickly show you how you could use Stokes' Law. So, if you take a ping pong ball, table tennis ball, and drop it in air, uh, what's its terminal velocity? Well, you know that when it reaches terminal velocity, the drag force is going to be equal to the force of gravity, so the net force is zero, so it moves at a constant velocity. So you can very quickly calculate it. Using Stokes' law, we set it equal to mg. Plugging in our numbers, the radius um, is two centimeters. Viscosity of air is this. Times velocity equals its mass, 2.7 uh, kilograms, or sorry, grams, times the acceleration of gravity, g. And if you solve this, you'll find the terminal velocity of a table tennis ball is 3,900 meters per second. Um, for those of you who are curious, that's, a Mach, that's about Mach 12, or 12 times the speed of sound. And um, if you try this at home, I guarantee this is not correct. What's gone wrong here? Um, part of the issue is that, again, uh, we're not guaranteed laminar flow around a table tennis ball. And it is moving fast, so it kind of violates Stokes' law. And most importantly, there's some sticking to it as well. So how do you solve that? Um, yeah. <laughs> so there is another way of calculating air drag. And it's for at larger velocities, the force of drag is approximated by the following formula. One half times C times rho times A times V squared, where C is the coefficient of drag Typically, you find that experimentally in a wind tunnel. Um, oh, that should be a close. Um, never mind there. Uh, rho is the density of the media it's moving through. A is the cross-sectional area as it goes through it, and B, V is the velocity. Given that the actual terminal velocity for a table tennis ball is 8 meters per second, a little bit less than we calculated before, and the density of air is 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter, what's the coefficient of drag? Um, just solving it again, this time using this formula, um, plugging in the velocity, the cross-sectional area, which is just pi r squared, times the density of air times the coefficient of friction from 1 to 1 half. You'll discover that the coefficient of drag for a table tennis ball must be about 0 0.54. Is that consistent? Yeah, typically for spheres, the drag coefficient's about 0 0.45. You might say, well, all right, is, is that good or bad? Well, spheres are not the most aerodynamic object. I would just want to show you real quick. Here's some uh, coefficients of friction or, or coefficient of drags for some other objects. Airfoil is crazy small. Um, Toyota Camrys and Focus cars typically have very small coefficients of drag. Why? You want to make, you make them go fast. 
Ironically, even a Ferrari still has a, a larger coefficient of friction uh, drag than these do, but ironically, it has a smaller cross-sectional area than these do, uh, which is why its drag is actually smaller. <laughs> Pork pickup trucks, fairly large. The sphere we talked about already. Hummers, not very aerodynamic. Um, skydivers, not so much as well. Bicycles, when you're riding your bike, it's large. Um, it, if you're going a spread eagle, you get very large drag coefficients. And a circular flat plate falling even worse because you get some co <laughs> you get some terrible non-laminar flows or or, or um, uh, turbulent flows around the edges. Um, I'm going to skip this one for now. Why? Because you actually have a derivation of this back in the calculus part. Um, I may come back to this a little bit later. So the part I wanted to end up with tonight is this. Um, normally, in this chapter, we do an air drag mini lab. And what we do is we drop multiple layers of coffee filters down the stairwell and measure, measure the terminal velocity using a sonic sensor, uh, one of those rangefinder things. We can't really do that, but what I did find, I had to go dig back for some labs, is some fairly decent data from the AP Physics class in 2015. Uh, what they did is dropped uh, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 coffee filters down there. They measured the mass before they dropped them and measured the terminal velocity um, as they fell. Um, on the picture here, you can sort of figure out the area on it as well. So what I'd like you to do with this data is go ahead and complete the AP Physics Mini Lab on terminal velocity, um, or sorry, air drag mini lab. It's fairly easy and fairly not too, not too painful, I promise. Um, but you just use this data as if you took this data in class. And I'll pick up the rest of this chapter next time. Have a great night. Ask me questions. Don't forget about office hours. You can drop in during those times. I've got posted. I'll be here just to answer questions. Otherwise, I'll be staring or just sitting here twiddling my thumbs. So make sure you drop in just to say hi uh, using Zoom. Right now, Zoom, I believe, is unblocked even in China during the coronavirus crisis. So you should be able to just hop in whenever you want. Have a good night. We'll talk to you soon.